So you've decided to start your journey into non-invasive vascular testing. A wise choice. Egypt, specifically ancient Egypt of the New Kingdom period. What an incredible civilization, renowned for its historical discoveries and achievements, such as the Great Pyramids, the Great Sphinx, and Venus Insufficiency. Yes, you heard that correctly. Venus Insufficiency has been documented as early as 1500 BC via a case study in the Abers Papyrus, an ancient Egyptian manuscript. This goes to show just how prominent vascular disease has been throughout human history. Its prominence continues into present day, with the prevalence rates worldwide soaring as the patient population becomes older. Consider what premier vascular expert, Dr. Tom Rook, has to say about the prevalence of arterial and venous diseases. What is the prevalence rate of arterial occlusive disease? It's really dependent uh, on the population that you're looking at. Obviously, in people that are very young, you don't see much of it. As we get older, we see more. It's, it's roughly 5% by the time we're 65, 10% by the time we're 75, and over 20% of the population by the time we're in our 80s. There are other varieties of arterial diseases that we deal with. There's things like fibromuscular dysplasia. There are uh, entities in which arteries become compressed, and uh, we have vasculitis. Taken together, these each are relatively uncommon, but as we begin to add them all, all up, you find that it affects a significant proportion of the population. The prevalence rates for CVI, chronic venous insufficiency, um, are, are significant. It's a major problem in this country. It's always very hard to dig out exactly uh, the rates. What I can tell you is that if you start at the simplest venous problem we have, varicose veins, that'll affect about 30% of the population and probably 50% of people over the age of 50. We have other venous problems like deep venous thrombosis, DVT. That's um, uh, also a little questionable and hard to get really solid information about the prevalence because we don't always count it the same way. Are we talking about a calf DVT or a, a DVT that occurs farther up in the leg? These are often counted differently. But the rates are significant. On average, maybe one in a thousand people will have a DVT every year. Considering the importance of vascular disease in modern society, the importance of accurately diagnosing and treating it cannot be overstated. Fortunately, modern society has access to something unique that ancient Egypt never did, ultrasound technology. This incredible skill can be utilized across a wide spectrum of professions and fields, including, but not limited to, ultrasound sonography, vascular medicine and vascular surgery, cardiology and interventional cardiology, radiology and interventional radiology, hematology, internal medicine, and nursing. During this course, you will learn concepts that are essential to every ultrasound sonographer. These include basic concepts such as nebology and ergonomics, advanced concepts such as image optimization, and clinical concepts such as sonographer-patient communication. The course will continue with a comprehensive review of the lower extremity peripheral arteries systematically covering anatomy and physiology, hemodynamics, and pathology. This information will be put to practice via interactive ultrasound session that demonstrates how to perform the technical protocol on patient models, as well as how to identify 
and interpret positive findings on real patients with significant pathology. Subsequently, we will review the lower extremity peripheral veins with an equivalent degree of detail, encompassing both the deep and the superficial venous systems, as well as the evaluation of both venous patency and venous insufficiency with real patients. This course aims to not only provide you with a solid foundation in vascular sonography, but to be an interactive learning experience that you will never forget. So, let's get started. Hello, I'm Brad Stavanovic. Let us review the anatomy of the lower extremity arterial system. We will start with the main artery of the lower limb, the femoral artery, also known as the common femoral artery, is a continuation of the external iliac artery, which is also the terminal branch of the abdominal aorta, as seen on the screen here. The external iliac artery becomes the common femoral artery when it crosses the inguinal ligament, which on this diagram is around this area here. It has five branches, the superficial iliac circumflex, which we can see on the top left hand on the screen here, the superficial epigastric, which we see on the top right here, the superficial external pedental, just below it, the deep external pedental, which is just below it again, and the deep femoral artery. As we cross the inguinal ligament, we enter the femoral triangle, where the profunda femoris artery originates from the posterior lateral aspect of the common femoral artery, which we see just over here. After which the common femoral artery has now become the superficial femoral artery. The profunda femoris artery travels posteriorly and distally, giving off three main branches. The lateral external femoral circumflex artery, which wraps around the anterior lateral side of the femur and it supplies the muscles of the lateral aspect of the thigh through its three branches. The descending branch, the ascending branch, and the transverse branch. The most significant disturbances to blood flow are due to a reduction in the radius of the vessel. This is caused by compression of the blood vessel, structural changes within the vessel, vasodilation or clotting of the vessel. We will go through a few examples of what affects flow rate, predominantly around the changes in vessel radius. In a healthy artery, vessel radius changes are dependent on stimuli, such as temperature, exercise, or an increased metabolic need of the tissue, and the accumulation of metabolites, or waste products. The hypothalamus senses a change in body temperature and sends impulses to the blood vessels affected. In the case of increased heat, these impulses cause the arteries of the affected parts of the body and the capillaries in the skin to dilate. In the case of colder temperatures, the arteries and capillaries vasoconstrict, which shunts blood back to the vital organs to maintain their metabolic requirements and temperature. This vasodilation increases blood flow under the skin, which enables more heat to be lost through evaporation and the perspiration response. As exercise is known to increase body temperature, this is a vital mechanism to ensure the body remains within its narrow, optimal temperature range. During exercise, such as walking on a treadmill, the blood supply to the muscle of the cuff increases dramatically. To accommodate this volume, vasodilation happens as a normal physiological reaction. Because of simultaneous increase in blood volume rate and the cross-sectional area of the vessels during the dilation, the pressure in the normal vessel remains relatively the same. When the vessel has a stenosis proximal or obstruction proximal to that segment, the pressure drops and in severe cases does not return to normal values even after five minutes rest. In more mild disease, the pressure also can drop, 
but then return to the normal value very fast after the stop of the exercises within two or three minutes. Having a solid grasp of normal arterial anatomy, physiology, and hemodynamics will now enable us to properly understand what happens when these systems cease to function normally. In other words, it will enable us to understand pathology. Dr. Rook explains which vascular pathologies the average patient should be most wary of. The vascular pathologies that the average patient needs to worry about are, are primarily peripheral artery disease and deep venous thrombosis. We do have issues with varicose veins and with chronic venous insufficiency, but they tend to be, on average, a little milder. They're not limb-threatening. They're typically not life-threatening. Uh, peripheral artery disease, because it's also uh, occurs in conjunction with things like coronary artery disease and cerebral disease affecting the brain tends to be a very bad thing to have in terms of longevity, in terms of overall health. It's also something that can threaten the limb, so you may lose your leg uh, as a result of peripheral artery disease. As you can see, arterial pathology, particularly peripheral arterial disease, can be quite serious. The ability to properly identify arterial pathology is essential to patient care. Thus, as healthcare providers, it is our duty to understand pathology as well as pathophysiology behind it. Let's review these concepts with Dr. Jose Diaz. Atherosclerosis is a disease in which plaques build up inside of the arteries. As you can see in the graph, it narrows the lumen. If we take a look in the evolution of the plaque, we have different stages. Initially, we have a circulation uh, of white blood cells in the wall. This is um, followed by uh, fatty streaks that we can observe early on in life, which represent mainly intracellular lipid accumulation. The next step will be an intermediate lesion in where intracellular lipid accumulation of a small uh, cellular lipid pores are accumulated in the wall. Now, a next step is to define the atheroma, in where we have an intracellular lipid accumulation core with extracellular lipids. The next step is the fibroatheroma, which could be single or multiple lipids core with fibrotic calcified layers. And finally, the complicated lesion, which is the surface defect hematoma.